I want to start going to the gym three times a week or I want to try intermittent fasting. It takes two to three weeks to get that, you know, to not feel like it's really difficult. It's okay for them to try something and fail because they know that you'll just still be there encouraging and, and helping them learn from it and not kind of trying to be good at everything. Yeah. Play, play to your strengths and neuroscience really supports that. I do believe in identifying what your passions are, it usually aligns with what your strengths are, maybe not always, but thinking about it that way is, is a really good way to think about it and not kind of trying to be good at everything. Yeah. Play, play to your strengths and neuroscience really supports that. This person is really, really, really good at what they do, but they've got no emotional intelligence. And unless you can help them change, we're going to have to get rid of them. It's that bad. Like, oh, wow. I mean, not so much recently, but more when I was coaching, like around the time of the financial crisis and the consequences of that. There were still people that would shout, go red in the face, make people cry, like make people not you know, want to quit their team and stuff like that. So that was almost me having to do like neurogenesis <laughs> with them. But I would definitely help them to see what they're really good at and, and play to that because that, those are quick wins and in coaching I would want people to get quick wins because then they'll believe that they can change things and that I can help them and a lot of coaching is about building up that relationship of trust so that it's okay for them to try something and fail because they know that you'll just still be there encouraging and, and helping them learn from it. It's really, it's a very like privileged, like special kind of relationship because it's intense, it's one-on-one, -on -one, it can be very emotional. But the main thing I found that helped these senior guys who are pretty much at the top of their career ladder, don't really have to worry about finances, why would they put in that effort that it's going to take for them to now change their behaviour? And a lot of them said, it's too hard, I don't understand what I need to do, I don't understand what people mean when they say you need to be more caring or understanding or emotionally intelligent. And I don't, I don't know if I can do it. And so I explained neuroplasticity to them, like building a brick wall or building a pathway. So one of the analogies that I could use is if you came up to a field that was like knee high in grass, then the first time you walk across that field, you're going to be pushing that grass down with your feet and maybe some of it would bounce back up. But if you walk that same path every day for a week, you probably would have trodden a sort of, you know, just a, a, a pathway through the grass that you can walk through easily. If you then said, OK, I'm going to lay down some wooden slabs to make it even easier to walk along there, and then you built that further and you maybe like cemented them in or whatever, then eventually you could make a path that's so easy to walk down that it takes no effort at all. And it's exactly the same in the brain when you learn something new. And so what I would get these guys to do is, I'd say go home tonight and listen to your child for five minutes without interrupting them and not having your phone on your person. And that alone was so eye-opening for people because they were never doing it. They were always asking, how did, how, you know, how was school today? Did you do your homework? Did you do this? Did you get 10 out of 10 on your spelling test? And they'd probably be scrolling on their phone half the time and the child would feel that they weren't really listening. And this happened with men, women, all different ages. And then I'd say, okay, now try this with a friend. Try to like have a you know, conversation where you really listen to them and you don't interrupt them. And then they do that. And then the next stage would be with a colleague, but somebody they've got a good relationship with. And then by the time they started feeling like, yeah, I can do this, I can really listen. I don't have to like sort of answer back all the time we'd get them to the point where they'd have a conversation like that with somebody that they haven't been getting on with at work. And that pathway was sort of built in the brain by then. So, oh. yeah. It really depends how attention intense the task is. So if it's something like, I want to start going to the gym three times a week, or I want to try intermittent fasting, it takes two to three weeks to get that, you know, to not feel like it's really difficult. When we're talking about things like emotional intelligence or intuition or creativity, we're talking more like six to 12 months. But I have this new theory, which I haven't really shared before, which is that if you really focus on doing this in a nine month period, which is the gestation period of a baby, so from fertilization to a newborn baby being born, 
you can essentially create a rebirth in your brain by rewiring your neural pathway. So emotion intelligence is two things, which is one that you actually understand and are able to regulate your own emotions. And then the second part is that you understand what's going on emotionally for somebody else. And you can respond to that in an appropriate manner, compassionate, but not getting sucked in. So in terms of the yourself part, just like naming how you're feeling. So finding a word for how you're feeling and, you know, and I say this with, from a, a position of really caring, but it's, it's harder for men to do that than women because of the way that we're still brought up in society, which is big boys don't cry and, um, you know, don't, don't be sad or sort of. So having a wider vocabulary for your emotions and you can start off by either just, you can check in with yourself every hour and say, how am I feeling emotionally? You can do it one to four times a day. You could journal. Um, and then in terms of other people, just spend listening. That's why that listening exercise is so important Be and listening without interrupting and looking at people's um, facial expression and stuff like that. So I would say to you, and this is obviously isn't going to apply to everybody else, but just in the exact same way that you learned to do a physical examination on a patient, you kind of go through that checklist of like, okay, these are the things, like, what am I seeing here? Is this person smiling at me? Do, are their eyes welling up with tears? Are, are they starting to raise their voice? Is their voice quivering? Just really hmm. paying attention to those things. Resilience to stress and emotional intelligence, as a former psychiatrist, those were my bread and butter after okay. the financial crisis. Back to those basics, and I'll always keep coming back to those basics, sleep, diet, hydration, exercise, and mindfulness. Yeah, that, that, that's the five like really easy ways to think about it. But we have at Heights, we have some like more pillars around that, like curiosity. And, and then I would use heart rate variability technology to see what was actually and show them what was actually going on in terms of stress, like how well you're sleeping, how stressed you are during the day. If there are any periods of time, hopefully whilst you're sleeping, but also during the day that you find a way to recharge and like rejuvenate your nervous system. But there's a reason that we have an adaptive response to stress, which is that sometimes you need to get away from something that's bad for you. So we we do need that ability to get, get into the... If you think about, we say these words without ever really thinking of them, but it's fright, flight, fight. And a fright is a threat. So you need to be able to, you know, get away from a threat. And that's the response is that either flight, you run away, or fight, you respond to that threat in a, in a sort of equal manner. And then parasympathetic, which as medics we would say is rest and digest, but I prefer to say rest and recharge because you're not always digesting, is when you recover from whatever stress response you've had to go through during the day. It's very different for different people. So, and interestingly, they may be, you know, moderately stressed and at some points maybe have flow states, but it was rare during the day at work, but they'd always be more stressed when they got home and they had to see their kids. So that was interesting. These these executives were, were stressed during the day, but it was kind of something that they could control. But then when it was like home and young kids or screaming kids or just being pulled in two different directions, they, they found that really stressful. So we actively need to do things to help to push our body into a state where it can recover.